Alright guys, BLM here back with a new video and in this video I'll be talking about my thoughts on the latest season of The Circle US Season 4, the first season filmed since the cancellation of the UK series, which through that I was expecting this season to be bringing some new innovative ideas that had been on the back burner with this now being the only version of the show and to be honest we just simply didn't get that. We got a season that mostly felt the same, being formatted similarly to that of previous seasons and really just kind of feeling stale at this point with similar casting archetypes that made this season feel like a mix of like seasons one and two to me, feeling like a step down from season three which again I enjoyed as like very game heavy circle season and this felt like a step backwards with it more so focusing around these like similar style of characters and twists that we've seen in the past. But to get deeper into the season, we'll be running through the season from beginning to end. So let's start off with episode one, which ends up being your typical circle premiere. And really this entire first week felt very reminiscent to me of season threes, with it mostly revolving around a singular twist with very little actual movement in the game, which leads to a bit of a slower start. And then we get to meet the cast with the first four entering and thus getting introduced to some of the major characters here. First we see Frank, who instantly comes off as a really likable figure and really gives you the vibe of someone that should be able to easily ride to the final just due to his inherent likability. Yu Ling also comes off just as likable, though I was surprised to see her not get into a similar position as Frank early on, with her ending up kind of low on the initial ratings. Alyssa ends up being one of the bigger players of the season, but here she really gets a lot of focus around her job as an assistant to a sex coach, with her saying vagina a lot and her having a vulva pillow, which was weird. And then we get to our first catfish of the season in John, who is playing as his mom, Carol who right away seemed to be primed to be the like successful catfish of the season, which we typically only get one of every season. But Carol ends up playing this game really strategically and seemed to be a player with mostly accurate reads throughout the game. Though I do feel like this is a situation where he probably would have just had an easier road had he just come in playing as himself. While playing as Carol did allow him to be like the mother of the circle, it obviously did also lead to a lot of people being suspicious of him as a catfish and also using this position as the matriarch in a strategic way. Now after your typical first circle chat, we do get another three players, starting with Krissa, who introduces herself as a lesbian that plays with balls, and right away she did give me serious Casey from BB20 vibes with her obviously being a former athlete that they'd have good people skills but a personality that didn't really translate to TV that well for me and for the most part I didn't find her that interesting here. Brew comes off very unremarkable as well, though does end up talking about his big social media following, which, I mean, I, I've never heard of him. But then we get introduced to Parker, this 21-year-old who talks about her only personality traits being partying and being a sorority girl. So in her infinite wisdom, she ends up deciding that with her life experience, she can play her father, Paul. And right away, you could tell she was being set up for a flame out here. I mean, she talks about being one of the more cutthroat players and decides to like change her dad's job to a marriage therapist for some reason, even though all of his photos make it look very apparent that he's a real estate guy. And even Alyssa calls that out right away. And again, this does lead to a lot of fun content with Parker with her really showing what not to do when playing the circle. Though, to be fair to her, I do feel like if she did come in as herself, she would also be the typical first boot in the circle, being this really attractive younger girl that typically gets booted for being suspected as a catfish. So I do think playing a catfish was the right choice for her, but not playing someone that has such a radically different life experience from her. And we just get like a constant barrage of people undermining her in the edit. Yeah, Alyssa's real estate broker comment. You have her not knowing who Rod Stewart is or what a memoir is. And again, it really just felt like all this set up for a disaster here. But like Parker herself ends up being a pretty fun character as well. Where like even on her own, she's like looking in the mirror and saying that she's a guy and she's trying to imitate like a guy's walk and 
All this came off really over the top, but again, it was pretty fun. We do also get the typical icebreaker game, which really just felt like a formality to have a way for the players to get to know each other before the first ratings, which end up going as expected with Frank being the clear frontrunner for influencer and then Carol also ending up as influencer as well. And also we do have Paul at the bottom because obviously it really ends up being an easy boot moving forward, but we do have to wait until the end of episode two for the actual blocking itself. Now along the way, we do see a boys chat and a girls chat as you would expect from the circle. And really not much of note really comes from this outside of the girls agreeing to work together, which doesn't truly hold. But it has some minor ramifications moving forward. And again, really a lot of this portion of the season really just felt repetitive. Again, same stuff we've seen before from the circle. But the episode does end with a twist where Frank, as the top influencer, gets to pick a player to join the game. And the player he ends up picking will be played by two of the Spice Girls in Mel B and Emma Bunton, which is a really random twist. I mean, like, obviously I get them wanting the Spice Girls as these like massive celebrities and also this gimmick for the show, kind of similar to what they did with Lance Bass, but obviously with the real Spice Girls actually being there this time, and I did find them to be pretty interesting TV here, but I did feel like for really the next three episodes, so much of the screen time was dedicated to them, that does lead to a bit less of character development over the course of like the back half of this first batch of episodes. But then we get to episode 2 where we do see the Spice Girls enter the game and we do find out that they have a mission while being there. They end up not being proper players here but instead in a similar way to what they did with Richard Maidley in UK series 2, they do have a goal here in staying undetected. And if they do, they will increase the prize fund by $50,000. Which I will say, I do find it really dumb that they actually spoiled the result of this in the season trailer by showing the players reactions to the $150,000 prize so to me there was no suspense on whether or not they would succeed and even then I don't care like I don't care that they're getting a minor increase in the prize money like that's something that me as a viewer just does not care about so again to me the twist itself really didn't add anything to the show but, I mean, Emma and Mel B are just fantastic characters, and seeing them here did lead to a lot of fun interactions. They had a really fun banter, and seeing them have the play as Jared, a children's author, did lead to them humorously, like, stumbling their way through creating their bio, with Mel B thinking that using a profile picture of Jared with a chicken would make him look more like an author, which makes no sense. They talk about like giving him an obsession with cheese and we later see them tell the group that Jared's stories are about animals and poop and all of these things were just ridiculous moments that did add a lot of humor to this season. Now along the way we do also get the return of the cake decorating challenge where most of the cakes here were actually pretty good but Parker does a bit too well to where it further adds suspicion that she's a catfish and people are also disappointed by Carol's who was supposed to be a baker which starts suspicion that he is a catfish as well we also get the first thruple conversation with a brew Alyssa and Yu Ling creating a bit of an alliance and along with that comes some really cringy dialogue from Yu talking about not wanting to be in a three-way with anyone else but we also do end up getting an awkward conversation between Paul and Carol which in reality is obviously these two catfish talking to each other playing as their parents which leads us up to the elimination where there really was no suspense here in Parker being the clear boo and while they do try to use the Paul Carol conversation to add some intrigue of like oh is Carol gonna try to save her it's like it was clearly not gonna happen and we do end the episode on the cliffhanger of her getting to meet someone as usual but let's talk about Parker, who, again, to me was a fantastic character across the first couple episodes here, where she really does everything wrong, and I think shows you exactly how not to play the circle. Really ends up being fun TV, though, through her complete aloofness across this season. Obviously, from a gameplay perspective, I, I think there is a serious debate for her being the worst circle player of all time, despite the fact that she is one of the best, if not the best, character of this season. But now let's jump into episode 3, which does start with Parker's visit to Carol, which again is a fun dynamic considering the two catfish here are doing the same thing. But here we do get them awkwardly flirting, which seems to be such a common occurrence on the Netflix version of The Circle. But through Parker's goodbye message, it does lead to some doubt being cast on Carol for being a catfish. 
to which we have Alyssa openly call her out on it, which was definitely a questionable decision for her, putting a strain on her relationship with Carol, with the two having been pretty close before this. Though afterwards, we do also get a combo between Alyssa and the Spice Girls that end up also leading to some awkward flirting, and the show really makes a big deal of this, of, oh, Alyssa has flirted with the Spice Girls. But again, scenes like this just end up being kind of boring to me. We do also see Carol doing some damage control and trying to use her influencer status as leverage by taking credit for saving Yu Ling in the previous round, which was nice to see him thinking strategically about the game, but when the info eventually gets around, it does end up backfiring on him instead, or through him saying similar things to Alyssa, and then him also having technically thrown Frank under the bus by saying this, it does cause him to burn his relationships with all three of them. But then we do get to the arrival of the two new players, both of which I felt were severely underutilized in this first batch of episodes, largely due to how much of a focus there was on the Spice Girls. But first we do see Rachel, who gets a bit of a wacky intro, being this paranormal researcher, but does have a fun energy here. While the other is Alex, who is actually someone that I did know of beforehand, where he is someone that had played in some sequester minis. So considering he is a massive fan of reality television, I was excited to see him get a shot here in the circle, but instantly was kind of disappointed to see him playing as Nathan, a 22 year old frat boy, which to me felt like the wrong decision for him to take here. Now it ends up working out where he's able to play this like younger brother figure to the rest of the cast, but I do feel like this douchey frat bro character is not the ideal one you would want to play coming into the circle, but to be fair I feel like this was probably more of a production choice than his. But each of these new players get to invite two other players to have a private chat with, which really doesn't play much of a factor here, but it is the type of intro that we have seen in the past for these new players. But the episode does end with a 90s party where the players do find out about the twist, which does lead to the entirety of the next episode revolving around the upcoming vote to determine who the Spice Girls are. Which again, I do feel like was a major detriment to these two new players, as I feel like we didn't get to know them that well until the next batch of episodes. Now let's jump into episode 4, which again largely revolves around the Spice Girls doing their rounds and trying to convince everyone that it isn't them, and if I was in the circle and had known that Frank had picked a player to join the circle, that would make me think that this is obviously the person that the Spice Girls are playing, as obviously they wouldn't allow a singular person to decide who would make it on their show and who wouldn't. Like, obviously he is picking a profile for someone else to use, so I feel like they could have easily put this together, but really something I do hate about this twist is the fact that the players actually get punished for getting the answer right. Now, obviously the producers don't want the players to get it right, as they obviously want the Spice Girls to look good and also want to increase the prize money, as that was something that was always part of their intention, but for the players to be rewarded for failing here and being punished if they succeed does seem very dumb conceptually. Though obviously they do frame it under the guise of, oh, it's the Spice Girls being successful instead of the other way around. But right away we do see Alyssa and later Frank really clock that Jared is the fake here, but really everyone else just goes all over the board, with the Spice Girls throwing Rachel under the bus after she had claimed that she's a massive Spice Girls fan, and also throwing Alyssa under the bus for using the term spicy in her bio, and again, they really make it seem like they're doing really impressive work here when before they really do anything we already see people's suspicions going all over the place with Alex already suspecting Rachel and Krissa Ray being anti-Carol at this point so again I didn't find any of the work that the Spice Girls themselves did to be very impressive here even though it does obviously work out for them we do that also get a Spice Girls trivia game that mostly played out as this like big mind game of the real players trying to make themselves not look like the Spice Girls by wanting to get the questions wrong but also worrying about the ramifications of looking like a catfish for not knowing certain questions and again it was a fun dilemma here but really didn't play that much of a factor but along the way we do get some important content from the foundation of the frank Krissa alliance which again was clearly a thing already but this is the first time they really get highlighted on this show and to be honest i was actually kind of expecting them to be a pretty strong duo moving forward which was obviously a take that didn't exactly age well we also see the start of the yuling nathan relationship which 
obviously involves awkward flirting as always, but the episode does end with the eventual vote with it being a really awkward cliffhanger for the first batch considering, again, they did spoil the result in the preview, but also the fact that the cliffhanger happens around the halfway point in the voting where the Spice Girls only need one more vote. So obviously they were going to succeed here and... Considering they do leave in the middle of episode 5, let's just talk about the Spice Girls here, which again, I don't love how much screen time they hogged up here, but I did find them to be fun TV. I thought they had fun banter and just were straight up entertaining while they were there. Now I do wish that they were full on players, where I do think that would have made this entire casting gimmick a lot more interesting, but obviously that would probably cost the producers a lot of money. Though they do end up actually booning the entertainment of the first few episodes of the show here, despite the fact that they do have some negative loss long-term ramifications on the season as again like outside of parker i mean i did feel like they were the ones bringing a lot of humor to the early episodes here it's just a shame that again it was to the detriment of the development of certain other players but with that let's jump into episode five where the spice girls get revealed by having jared vote for himself which i did feel like was a fun way to reveal it here and they do get to meet someone on their way out and i was shocked that they didn't end up meeting rachel with how much Rachel talked about being a fan of them, but instead they end up visiting Alyssa, and they end up really propping up Alyssa here, with them playing up how well she's playing the game, and Alyssa does talk pretty intricately about the game here, with her mentioning how the Manch Alliance is, and this did feel like the most pure strategy we have heard on The Circle, which again is a show that I think typically tries to stay away from too in-depth of strategy, but beyond this we do get to the start of this one-sided rivalry between Nathan and Alyssa, with him thinking that she's a catfish and him trying to throw her under the bus which did feel like a weird obsession for him moving forward especially considering he does build strong relationships with many of Alyssa's allies so I do feel like the move would have been to try to join the alliance instead of targeting her which again ends up working out in that way anyway but as a whole, I did feel like Alex's stick of being this like strategic mastermind did get a bit old to me even by this point in the season. We do then get a game where everyone has to anonymously answer questions and during this, Carol really starts to get thrown under the bus here with everyone openly talking about how Carol is a catfish and with her being labeled as the most strategic. Though along the way, she also gets tied for most trustworthy and most likely to win, which in turn also puts a big target on her back. But beyond this, it did feel like we were starting to get the formation of these two sides that I was hoping to see battle it out like we did in season three, though that doesn't truly happen here. But we do have the Trouple who re-solidifies here and do talk about adding Nathan to their group to Bruce Chagrin as he did want him more as a side piece than a part of the true alliance but we do see Nathan putting in good work with the other side as well with him talking to Chris and Frank and them solidify a grouping but then we get to the ratings which was weird to have them here with both Nathan and Rachel still safe to where we only have six eligible players to be booted from this early on in the game. But here we do get some interesting strategy from Brew, who explicitly says the fundamental issue with the show being so focused on catfish hunting in that he rates Carol number one, saying he doesn't care if she's a catfish because she's still loyal to him, which again really shows why catfish hunting has always felt dumb to me on the show but we do also get some interesting strategy from alex who ends up rating carol high talking about this being a long-term plan to paint a target on her back while also rating brew low despite wanting to work with him as he's trying to make him feel like nate is his only option moving forward which again are decent strategic thoughts here but the latter of which did very much feel like a suboptimal move to me as to me the best position to be in in the circle is for you not to be the influencer but for your allies to be the influencers and for him to intentionally knock brew down did feel like poor play from him in which he doesn't have brew to keep him safe while also opening up the possibility of brew going home but the episode does end up ending awkwardly with alex deciding once again that he's gonna be targeting Alyssa, which doesn't get immediately followed up on and now let's get to episode six where a lot of the episode does revolve around the players having to roast each other with nikki glazier hosting this segment and this was just kind of dull with a lot of the players playing pretty diplomatically and again this is just a thing that we've already seen we literally just saw it last season with lil yachty where that was like a diss track this is a roast pretty much the same thing 
Though I did get some humor from Krista thinking hers were like really funny only for everyone else to find them really cringy. I did also like seeing Nikki scold them for making terrible jokes. Though I do feel like this is kind of where Rachel comes out of her shell a bit, calling out the catfish in her roast that did seem to start this dichotomy of her being this like mostly zen figure, but then like out of nowhere she's just willing to cause chaos at points. Now from a game standpoint, this is also where we do see Yu Ling end up talking to Frank and Krissa, where she ends up bonding with them and creating a new three with them, which does end up putting Yu in a really good spot in the game with her being well liked by everybody and being in the middle of numerous groupings here. Also, this does end up setting up the eventual Krissa boot, which does end up being a mostly suboptimal move for you, considering Krista did seem to be loyal to this three, but also ends up showing Yu's doubts on Brew, which Brew later in the episode does pretty good work in opening up to her, to which she feels good enough about him to go along with keeping him safe. And he also ends up solidifying his relationship with Nathan in this episode, so I felt like he did decent work here, and he does end up being safe as the Thropple ends up being in power with Yu Ling and Alyssa ending up as influencers and we do see Carol doing some sucking up to Alyssa by asking her for sex advice which is obviously weird as this is obviously John asking this as his mom but but Carol's connections to the women here and her coming off as someone that's not targeting Alyssa and Yu Ling and someone that is kind of in their back pocket does seem to have a pretty big influence here and while Yu does initially want to keep Carissa Alyssa is able to get her way and take Carissa out which ends up being a strong move on her end but might have been a case of her playing a bit too hard to get her way i do think causes some distrust with you moving forward but Krista was probably her biggest threat in the game with them seeming to not have a relationship at all while also being very well positioned with the other side of the house but awkwardly we do end the episode with you as the top influencer having to deliver the news of the blocking face to face and here I feel like we might as well talk about Krissa who again I didn't find that interesting of a character across this season but seemed to be a somewhat skilled player I mean being one that was able to bond and build trust with most of the people that she interacts with but again I just don't feel like her charisma really translated to TV and also I do feel like the biggest issue with her game is that she doesn't seem to be active enough in reaching out to other people to where she didn't seem to have relationships with people like Brew and Alyssa and Again, I feel like I really do see these similarities to Casey from BB20 and how they approach the social strategy elements of the game of just relying on their natural likability and having people approach them. That does leave some pretty big holes in Chris's game here. But with that, let's jump to episode 7 where we obviously see you visiting Krissa and Krissa does end up taking the news pretty well here seeming to be pretty understanding but this is also where we do see you really put the blame onto Alyssa which ends up being her MO moving forward where again I do feel like this situation was great for Alyssa on paper but, but it is one that does have some negative ramifications to it but also here we do have Krissa throwing Carol under the bus which does seem to have a major impact on you making her target Carol moving forward and does really end up solidifying you's relationship with Frank to where Yu fully declares her loyalty to him moving forward and ends up turning Frank against Carol and Alyssa while Yu also ends up taking Chris's spot in Frank's alliance with Rachel, which fully makes you the best positioned in the house at this point. Though obviously the intentionality of all of this is highly debatable, but after this we do get to see the arrival of the two new players, the first ending up being Everson, who has a really fun over the top energy that did very much remind me of like Herman from BB Can 10, and I did find him to be mostly likable here, while the final new player ends up being a familiar face in that being Trevor, the husband of Delisa from season two, the person that she catfished as. And I mean, this was a fine twist. I mean, Trevor is fine and this was a cool callback, but really I did find myself pretty indifferent over his casting here, though he does end up playing a catfish himself. And I thought it would have been funny had he decided to play as Delisa, though obviously that would have made everyone know it was a catfish and would have made him an even bigger target. But instead, he does end up playing as one of Delisa's friends, Imani, which still did feel like a bit of a mirroring of how Delisa ended up having to play. But to introduce these new players to the game, they end up having to throw their own parties, and the other players have to pick which party to go to, which gives these new players a private chat with the players that went to their parties, and I really didn't like this twist. I mean, the original players 
obviously pick what party to go to, but they don't get to see the new players beforehand. That means that they're essentially picking which party to go to based on only the invitations that were very minimal, and then also the theme, that of which was selected by the producers. So I did feel like Trevor got a massive advantage here from getting the Toga party while Everson was given an Under the Sea party, where again, in this situation, I feel like the Toga party just sounds more fun. And through that, Trevor ends up getting everybody but Rachel and Brew, which obviously you would assume would give him an advantage here based on literally nothing that he actually did. Instead, just a theme that production handed him. I feel like they should have been able to read the new players' bios first. In that sense, it would make this more of a decision on which of the two new players you want to spend time with over the randomness of what party do you want to attend. But the episode does end with the reveal that the circle is complete, which does make this feel like a really small-scaled season, only having two eliminations up until this point, and only original players having been eligible for elimination up until this point as well. So... This announcement definitely was very jarring to me. But then let's jump into episode 8, which starts with a lot of discussions involving the new players, where they start to get to know those that didn't attend their party, and through that they learn about Carol being a catfish, and about the Spice Girls, as really those seem like the only major events of the season so far. But when people do try to throw some sus onto Carol, Brew does end up sticking up for her, which was a major indicator of Brew's game view coming into the next elimination. But then we do get the reveal of the cyber attack, which the first part of this twist is the players getting to leak a photo from another player's album and ask them an anonymous question, which was a fine modification of similar games we've seen in the past. Though I was expecting this element of leaking a photo to have a much bigger impact than it really did, but we do have a lot of people calling other people out and them giving non-answer responses. We do have like you calling out Carol for being a catfish, and for a second I thought he was actually going to reveal himself, which I do think would have been an interesting move to make here that I really hope someone does someday of knowing that their cover is blown and just saying screw it and revealing that they're a catfish. As I do think it'll be interesting to see how they progress moving forward, but again, didn't happen here. We do also get the culmination of the one-sided Nathan Alyssa rivalry where Nathan ends up proactively lying here about Alyssa having told them that she had never been to Europe while showing a photo of her there just to cause distrust between her and the rest of the house, and I did like seeing a player play this aggressively in these anonymous questions here, though it really didn't seem to play that much of a factor, and also felt like an underwhelming conclusion to this rivalry, where Nathan obviously doesn't really play much of a factor in Alyssa's actual boots. Also here we do get Brew testing Nathan by asking him a basic golf question, and we have him frantically trying to figure it out, only for him to guess and get it right anyway, which was a fun scene, but then we get to the more important element of the cyber attack, where we find out that it is essentially a safety chain. Which, I do find funny how many reality TV shows have done safety chains this year. First, Celebrity Brother 3, then BB Can 10, now The Circle. But I do think it is a great twist that exposes relationships, and we do see Everson and Imani getting to pick who starts the chain, and it really seemed like a redo of the first ratings, where Frank's just natural likability really gives off a great first impression, and through that makes him an easy pick there, to where he ends up giving safety to Yu Ling, which does put her in a very precarious spot, where now she has to pick between her two alliances, and I do get why she doesn't save Alyssa here, and decides to save Rachel in order to prove her trust to Frank, but it did seem like a questionable move, considering through this move, she ends up burning both Brew and Alyssa, while I don't think Frank would have cared that much had she saved Alyssa, as he himself wanted Alyssa to be safe as well, and I do get her worries about Carol being safe if she picks Alyssa, but obviously it ends up happening anyway, so I do feel like this was the wrong choice for you. But the chain then continues, going from Rachel to Nate, then to Brew, and Brew having the deciding vote, and we do get a terrible cliffhanger before the choice itself that really sapped all the suspense, thus having to wait a full week to see that Brew ends up blocking Alyssa, which I do think is also a questionable move for Brew. I don't necessarily disagree with it, as Carol is someone with less options moving forward, and he's eventually able to win you back anyway, while Alyssa obviously has a lot more going for her in the game, but I do think to blatantly associate yourself with a well-known catfish can drag you down as well. So again, definitely a double-edged sword. But with that, let's talk about Alyssa, who was a pretty massive character over the course of these first two batches. 
Well, I wasn't that surprised to see her go here. I mean, her game did remind me like a bit of Savannah's from season two, maybe mixing that in with Sammy from season one. Now, while I do think Alyssa is a better player than Savannah, I do think they had a similar trajectory here. But I did like how she approached the game, where she seemed to be mostly playing strategically. And while I don't love that she would call certain people out in public chats, I, I do still look at her as a solid player and one that got a bit unlucky in how the safety chain played out, where over half the players won to keep her safe, but really the Rachel pick really spun it in a direction that really didn't favor her. Well then let's move on to episode 9 where again we do see the Alyssa elimination leading to Alyssa meeting Brew where we once again get some awkward flirting but Alyssa seems to be understanding of Brew's decision and really puts all the blame onto you for how this played out with her even calling out you in her goodbye message while also talking about how she respects Brew which did feel weird that she explicitly says names instead of just talking in code like they typically do. But this is all while you is upset that Alyssa didn't get saved along the way and this really does cause some initial tension between you and brew where you talks about targeting him next and being openly upset at him in the circle chat but once again brew is able to do good work in repairing their relationship to where you remains loyal to him until his eventual boot but really the rest of the episode to me was just kind of boring where we do get this like dumb game of the players being split into teams and having to walk around and get the most steps I mean that really led to nothing we get a lot of focus on the showmances with Rachel, Amani, and Yuling having a girls chat and Rachel talking about being their wing woman as the you-Nathan relationship continues and Amani talks about wanting a showmance with Everson and again I, I really just did not care about any of this and the episode even ends with this like really awkward flirting session between you and Nathan with them sending photos to each other and that was just weird but then let's jump into episode 10 where we now see the everson amani flirting session which was equally as cringy as again both of these pairings do involve catfish but we do finally see a conversation between frank and brew where frank opens up about losing his parents and this later leads to him revealing it to most of the house which ends up being solid personal content for frank here and did feel like the type of content you would see from a winner of the circle but then we get to the ratings where they mostly go as expected though humorously rachel ends up rating nathan low despite him calling her his number one ally and even though they do re-solidify after the ratings it really felt like nathan had way more loyalty in rachel than she had back with her obviously having stronger loyalties to you and frank but also here we do see nathan starting to put in some work in throwing brew under the bus which he later goes all in on after learning that him and brew are towards the bottom of the ratings which ends up being effective for him surprisingly to me but the ranking results do end up being somewhat interesting with the new players ending up in the middle and carol finally knowing that she's in danger with her being at the very bottom and we do get a bit of a predictable set of influencers here in frank and yu ling both of them being influencers for the second time but then we get a bit of a shake up in the elimination process but again not something that was completely unprecedented in that each of the influencers get to save two players each which goes as expected with frank saving Rachel and Amani while you saves Brew first again showing that Brew's work in rebuilding trust with her was effective and then also Nathan leaving Carol and Everson as the only vulnerable players and the episode ends with the reveal that these two players will end up having to meet as they await their fate but I mean come on obviously Carol was going home and let's just talk about Carol here who again was a massive character early on with them being this like premier catfish of the season though their game really gets blown up by the end of that first week though it did find it interesting to see these players like Brew and Alyssa actively want to keep him around despite knowing that he's a catfish though it does seem like once he does get caught the amount of screen time he was given does start to drop significantly where pretty much every bit of content he was given afterwards revolved around other people knowing that he's a catfish and he just seemed to be this pretty consensus boot for whenever someone outside of the Brew or Alyssa's of the world had gotten power. But yeah, at the end of the day, I do think he is a pretty competent player. But one I do think he would have been stronger as if he just played as himself. Though to be fair, obviously that was probably a decision by production. But now let's move on to episode 11 where obviously we do take some time to lead up to the eventual Carol boot. Where we do see Carol and Everson meet and it ends up being pretty underwhelming where I mean these two had literally had like one conversation beforehand so not a big reaction here but Carol's blocked and it does seem like this discussion between the two did have a pretty big impact on Everson where he does tell him to trust Brew and not trust you which does lead to Everson rating you low and trying to bond with Brew moving forward. 
But after the catfish reveal, we do see Brew tell the chat that he knew Carol was a catfish, to which they don't believe him as they don't understand why he would keep around a known catfish. Which I do think really shows you the lowered strategic ability of players like you, Frank, or Rachel, who think that this is like a ridiculous concept. Now we do also get the return of portrait mode, which really kind of ended up being underwhelming to me, where we see a lot of players just play it nice. Though eventually we do get Nathan being called out as a catfish, and we do get some more ridiculous images from like Nathan drawing Frank as a snake, and Everson drawing you as like demon eating corn. Which I know some people have talked about this being Everson being racist, which is not the way that I ever took it. I, I think this is more so him villainizing you due to the information he was given by Carol, and then him obviously mocking her profile picture of her eating this big thing of corn. So again, I mean, this was fine, but I feel like previous versions of portrait mode have been more entertaining but the episode does end with nathan again going all in on turning against brew by going to frank and telling him everything brew had told him making frank think that brew drew the snake photo instead of nathan and seeming to set up this eventual brew boot which i was like i was surprised that nathan ended up being pretty effective in this position as i really thought this plan would backfire on him but the fact that he does kind of undo all the good work that brew had just done was pretty impressive to me but with that let's jump into episode 12 which did feel like a weirdly paced episode to me with them trying to cram in so much that did make this end game feel very abbreviated but we do start with a talk about nathan with the portraits putting some doubt in yuling's mind about him which eventually leads to her rating him low but then we do get videos from home which in so many seasons in the past have been blatant indicators of who the winner was going to be by how these segments were presented as the winners typically get a larger focus here and are typically saved for last where we saw this with both delisa and james getting this highlight in the last two us seasons felix from the uk got a similar edit as well so when we do see you laying being saved for last year and getting extensive content talking about her wanting to give the money back to her parents to me it did feel like this was the typical edit for a circle winner though he didn't completely rule out frank either considering a lot of his personal content they end up getting in this final batch of episodes as well but then we get to the penultimate ratings where the players are told that the lowest rated player will be instantly blocked and through that we do get more strategic ratings here with more of the focus being on keeping yourself out of the bottom more so than putting your allies at the top but again we do see the work of nathan really coming into fruition where he does end up putting brew in last and despite everson and you rating him highly brew still ends up in last here and is instantly blocked and again they really do rush through this and his meeting with nathan where we do get some fun reactions from nathan revealing his strategic gameplay to brew and bruce seeming to respect him on the way out but then we do get the announcement of this being a double blocking with the top rated player being the secret super influencer which again Again, we do see every season, but Frank ends up getting it here, and again, he makes a decision right away, and we get this like weird way of revealing the results, where they decide to show the people who are in the final in a random order, and we're left on this cliffhanger of, is it going to be Everson or Nathan that go home? Which again, these style of cliffhangers that have you wait a week for the results are just not ideal to me, but right away next time we do see that the boot is eventually nathan which wasn't too surprising as obviously it's frank making the decision and considering his connection to frank wasn't as strong as it felt like the other people had and frank being someone that is so focused on these relationships that despite all this good work that nathan had put into avoiding that first elimination it wasn't that big of a surprise they didn't end up saving him here and with that, let's talk about the boots, starting off here with Brew, who I did find boring early on, but as the season continued, I did start to like him a bit more, largely due to the fact that he did seem to be playing the game strategically. He recognized the fact that catfish hunting doesn't matter. He built alliances and reached out to the right people at the right times to re-solidify his bonds. But despite those things, he obviously does get outplayed by Alex here, also seemed to just not be as naturally popular as someone like a Frank, which gave Frank and his side of things a lot of power at points, despite them not actively playing the game as much. But considering what Brew had to work with here, I was actually impressed with his ability as a player across this season. And I'll talk about Nathan, aka Alex, who, while at first I did feel like he was really just all talk and felt like this try-hard mastermind that didn't seem effective, at first, and while I do think the show kind of overplays how effective he was, 
He did end up saving himself over Brew and did a lot of active work across the season that I did find interesting to watch. And obviously a lot of this comes from the fact that Alex is this massive super fan of Survivor. And I do think he tried to bring that style of gameplay here over to the circle to which he ended up getting like pretty mixed results here. But I do think as a whole, he is someone that did add an interesting dynamic to the season here. And now let's jump into the finale, which obviously starts with Nathan's blocking. And we do get this fun meetup with Yu Ling, with her finding out that he's a catfish, which was a fun moment. Though I will say that I don't love how the other players talked about Alex. It did feel very weird that they were like kind of playing into this, oh, he's a nerd, so he must be a loser sort of talk with like being surprised he had a girlfriend like that did feel a bit icky to me but we then get the typical goodbye messages and the players getting the finalist breakfast and obviously all this leads up to the final ratings where instantly we get the vibe that a lot of the players here are not voting strategically where both frank and rachel mention that they're voting with their hearts and rachel even talks about how she thinks the others will too and really this does exemplify the issues i have with this season and then it felt like those that were actually trying to play the game were villainized and got taken out while all the people that have this mindset of reality TV that was very prominent back in the day, back in the early 2000s, which is kind of the spot where it feels like the circle still thrives in, are people that did make a deep run this season, do end up winning this season, which is just kind of boring and while we do get some great characters along the way it really just feels like a backstep from season three and purposely so where i do feel like even production hates the more strategic elements of the game but afterwards we do get to the players meeting which was very tame and not much of interest really happens there outside of the group being so surprised that Amani was a catfish and we see Trevor coming in and clearly acting as if he thought people would recognize him right away which they don't until he mentions that his wife was on the circle which I do find funny but then we get to the reunion where we do see the players reactions one by one to seeing who were booted after them and this leads to some awkwardness from like Parker not knowing who some of these people are and being told about the Spice Girls and I do like this overall format for the reunion while the reunion itself ends up being kind of unnotable I do like seeing these reactions to these big moments and big reveals with these players not even seeing each other until this reunion. But then we get to the results, which I'll be honest, did slightly surprise me. As I mentioned before, I did feel like you was the most likely winner coming into this finale, as again, I thought people liked her, and, and I thought that the few that were voting strategically would knock Frank out of that first spot. But for her name to come up in third was a pretty big shock to me, though at that point I was pretty confident it was going to be Frank over Imani, and Frank was the clear winner here, and I did like the reactions to his win, where we do see Trevor himself being really excited, and the show clearly loved that he won as well, and we get this constant talk about how genuine he was, and again, I, I think he's a likable person, very likable winner here, but... I really don't get why they're leaning into this from a production standpoint as this really just leads to boring TV with the show having no real major conflicts and really just sets a precedent for the series moving forward that disincentivizes interesting TV. But it was a heartwarming moment to see Frank win, though it was also kind of awkward to see the season end in the same way that previous seasons had, where they get to call home and Frank ends up calling his friends, which didn't have the same weight as like the Lisa calling Trevor or James calling his girlfriend, but still pretty satisfied with the Frank win considering how massive of a character he was across the season and considering the overall level of gameplay across the season was not the highest in the world. But with that, let's talk about the finalists starting with Everson, who I found to be a really fun presence here, but one that I do think would have done better if he had joined from the start. And because that he was kind of starting from behind, and while he does do a decent job at bringing a fun energy to the chats and building some decent bonds, I do feel like he was just never really a likely winner here. But I do feel like he could have been had he been in there from the beginning, and I did feel like he at least tried to spice things up by the end of it, even though all that really didn't matter. Next up, we have Rachel, who was fine. I mean, she was a likable figure. I mean, I don't like how much she is hung up on having to be genuine and playing with your heart but she seems to be a nice person but also seemed to be one of the least focused on players here of the end gamers and to be honest i kind of predict that she'll be one of the more forgettable figures for me beyond this season but again she was mostly just fine while she was there next up we have yu ling who i loved as a character here i mean i did love how expressive and over the top she was despite it being in a way that would typically annoy me but i do feel like you brought the type of energy that 
just clicks with the circle, which I think thrives on these like cringy conversations and over the top reactions. And that's exactly her personality. Now, again, I was also shocked that she didn't win considering again, it felt like her edit felt kind of in line with that of the previous winners. But to be honest, like not really to the extreme where I was like 100% confident, but I really felt like she was like the second most popular player that would give her the win in a similar way to how James won last season. So to see her all the way down third did kind of surprise me. But so I do feel like she is one of the more notable figures from this season. Next up, we have Amani, aka Trevor, who was there. I really didn't get much from him here with his casting largely feeling like a gimmick and him not bringing much entertainment to the show in the short time that he was there. Now, I will say I do think he played well as it felt like no one knew that he was a catfish and clearly comes close to winning here. And dare I say, I think he played better overall than Delisa who really just stumbled her way to a win with almost everyone knowing that she was a catfish for most of it. So the fact that Trevor here was able to avoid that and still come close to win, despite the fact that he joined the game late, I do feel like he overall played pretty well here, but just wasn't the most scintillating TV. And finally, let's talk about Frank, who was an extremely likable figure here that had so many fun moments across the season with his fun reactions and one-liners and also has this touching backstory that again really makes him feel like the perfect person for the circle the exact type of person that the circle wants on their show but also i do feel like he ends up playing pretty well here despite not being the most optimal strategic player in the world i mean impressively comes in first in the ratings and all but one round here he remained in the majority due to what seemed like his natural like ability that made most of the new entrants instantly cling on to him when they entered, and it's really just an impressive game all around, though I just don't know how active of a game it really was, as I just feel like that's Frank, that's who he is. Which is obviously a massive pro for a game like The Circle, which hasn't fully embraced the strategic elements of its game, though I do think in a more strategic game, and even probably even in last season, I do think Frank would probably lose as this big threat needs to be taken out before the end, or as this big threat that you're going to rate lower at the end. But again, for this specific cast, he really was the exact person to come into the season and end up dominating. But there we go. I mean, that's the entire season of The Circle, season four. Again, from what I want from the show, I do feel like this was a step back from season three, which I really enjoyed the strategic elements of and having these two conflicting sides trying to outmaneuver each other, while this season felt like more of a love fest, similar to season one, while also still having a level of strategy to it, but not to any extreme, kind of similar to season two. And through that, I really come out of the season just kind of fine with it. I mean, it wasn't my favorite season, but it wasn't a completely dull season either. I think there are some pretty great characters on the season and some really notable story threads from like how terrible Parker is at the game and to the Spice Girls, to the events of the safety chain, to Nathan's smear campaign against Brew. I mean, there are some solid moments throughout this season, but I do also feel like it mostly just feels the same as what we've seen beforehand from the show in a position where it feels like this basic format has gotten a bit old to me. I mean, the thing about The Circle is that unlike Big Brother and Survivor, which have great formats that are going to be good no matter who you put in it, The Circle is not that. The Circle is not a well-developed game. It's a game that is so basic and just really kind of boring that they need these other elements of the catfish hunting and having this like really over the top cast and these cringy conversations to keep it interesting. However, I do feel like moving forward, I really just want to see a massive shakeup in either the twist, the format. I do feel like something needs to give, though I don't know if production is really on my side with this. But really, those are my thoughts on The Circle Season 4. I mean, obviously we know that Season 5 has already been filmed, so I will be doing a review of that once that season finishes. And also in the reality TV sphere, we do still have BBAU and the Challenge All-Stars going on. Survivor 42 just finished. We have BB24 and the Challenge USA coming up soon. Survivor SA, I mean, there's a lot going on still, so stay tuned for content on that. But for now, that is the video. Thank you for watching.